I'm talking about, uh, I'll call this the Bride Series. And I feel it's a very prophetic, I need to say this again, I, I believe this is a very prophetic message. Because the Bible clearly says we're the Bride of Christ and we need to prepare ourselves. So what I've been wanting to do is, is put a parallel between a normal bride that we see every day and what are we as the bride of Christ, how are we preparing ourselves? Now remember, I started off and I shared Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses 1 to 13. And uh, so let me just say this. Uh, well, well, let me read it. Let me read two, uh, three verses. Matthew 22, verses 11 to 14. This is a very sad situation at the wedding. And it's talking about when we stand before Jesus one day. Jesus is giving us this parable. He says, but when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend. It's interesting. Jesus still calls him friend. How did you come in here without a wedding garment? So Jesus is showing us here like the five wise virgins. It's a very similar parallel to the story of the five foolish and the five wise virgins. Because the, the foolish virgins, and it's, it's symbolic of the church, that the half of us are asleep, half of us are going to miss out. And I don't want to miss out whatever this, this marriage is. I don't want to miss it out. <clears throat> whether it's going to hell or whether it's making it to heaven somehow or getting my reward. But remember what happened, the, the, the shout of the bridegroom and the, the five foolish virgins didn't have oil. So they asked those that had, please lend us some. They said, no, we've only got enough for whatever. And then they had to go and find the oil and the bridegroom came and the door was shut. And they missed out. And yeah, it says he was without a wedding garment. In other words, he was without the, the character that goes with or the, the covenant uh, code, if I can call it, that the groom needed. Because you never find a, a bride that just dresses sloppily. She wears a special dress. Have you noticed that? They wear one and only dress. They never wear normal clothes. We know it's tradition. And, and, and they do as much to the dresses as possible, which is symbolic for us, our, our righteousness in Christ and our righteous works. You can't separate the two, funny enough. The Bible talks about good works. and We don't get saved by good works, but we have to do good works. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The Bible says as long as you, you uh, see the day approaching of the Lord, that wedding day, <laughs> that, uh, provo provoke one another to love and good works. The Bible talks about that often. And uh, there's, a, there's many scriptures that talk about that. So, he says, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his, the servants, bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And I don't believe that's like eternal security, what some people preach. You've got to allow yourself to be chosen. Here's a scripture in Timothy that says, it says uh, that we need to purify ourselves as vessels unto honor. We, the onus is on us, that we are fit for the master's every use. We have to purify ourselves. Scriptures, you've heard me say so many times, the Bible says, strip yourself of your former nature. Put off the old man. Put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the armor of light. Put on the new man. Put on the armor of God. It's all the same thing. It's the character of God. I've explained that to you before. And so what, what, which groom will marry a haggard bride? Think about that. Jesus is not going to marry a haggard bride. 
He said in his word, he's coming for a glorious church. Glorious. We're not going to, we're not, the, the word haggard here means having a gaunt, wasted or exhausted appearance <laughs> as from prolonged suffering, exertion or anxiety, worn out, wild, wild looking, haggard eyes. Jesus is not coming for those kind of people. Those are the tears. Maybe this guy, whoever it was, this friend that didn't have a wedding garment is a tear. And you need to pray and ask God to help you not be a tear because the tear is going to hell. The Bible talks about six, let me just repeat, six kinds of false people in the church, false messiahs, false apostles, false prophets, false teachers, false pastors, and false saints. Six. It's interesting, there's six. The number for, for humanity under sin. And those are the tears, believe it or not. And, and there, there are many of them, many, many, many. Gosh, and as I, I was saying earlier on, there, there are so many distractions in the earth. You know, I was thinking about our voting here now. Do you know that half the country is happy and half the country is sad? If you think about it. So are you going to let something like that change your relationship or your faith because of politics? Or because of money? Or because of this or because of that? Or are you going to lock, lock onto Jesus? Lock onto the covenant promises? Because it doesn't matter what happens on earth. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Somebody did a study in America, and I happened to watch this. Uh, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans, there's always someone against someone. And, they, and, and it, polit, politics, it's like sport. I mean, you've got to take sides, you know. It's interesting how, how there's stuff in the world to make you take sides. I don't know if you've noticed that. You're always taking someone's side. And you, you have your opinion, you know. You, like, die for your opinion. And so... Uh, someone did a study in America about, the, and it's coming down to almost half, half now in America, where half are Democrats, half are Republicans. And they, the fight is like fierce, you know. And this one preacher actually did a study of all, the, from the time politics started, as it were, in, in America. And it, and it seems, if I, if, I, if I remember him saying that, there, there was equal rule over all those centuries or whatever, decades, I don't know how long, that the Democrats and the Republics shared. They, 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 they're almost equal. Some, sometimes it was Democratic, sometimes this. And he said, but one thing that, that never changed is America just kept going, regardless. So I, I'll never forget that. That was last year. I think it was Lance Walnu that shared that. Preacher, quite a powerful preacher in America. He has an amazing uh, eye for things, you know. And uh, you, I think it was him that was sharing it. So he says, so what? He says, it doesn't matter who wins. God's still on the throne. Politics cannot vote God off the throne. <laughs> That's a good one, eh? They can't, they can't vote Jesus off the throne. And for what it's worth, God allows what must happen on the earth because we have to live out the consequences of our choice so that when we stand before judgment one day, you know, you, you might be shocked at what I'm about to say. You're going to get judged for who you voted for. And I, I want to just say this. If you didn't vote, you have no room to criticize anything. If you could vote and you didn't vote, shut your mouth. Excuse the expression, shut your mouth. Because how can you criticize if you, didn't, if you didn't make a vote? And Christians must vote, by the way. They should have. Too late. You've got to wait four years now. I get so upset with people who they don't vote, but they have, they, they, they have everything to say. What? It's like not tithing and giving offerings, and then you try and tell the church how to run its money. Or you try and tell people what to do and what not to do, how to serve God. You, you, you know, it's like, it's like a, how can a mechanic go into a, 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 
an operation and tell a surgeon how to do an operation when he's never been trained to do that. So don't be intimidated by voices. Voices, yeah. For you know, I say that on purpose. Voices. <laughs> that are out there. And they like that song that was sung many years ago. I've never heard it sung for a long time. Chirpy, chirpy, cheap, cheap. Where's your mama gone? Or who's your mama, you know? Or who's your daddy? I know who my daddy is. I'm, 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 I'm mocking demons now, to be honest. I'm mocking the unrighteous because they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. You've got to stick with the word, guys. Listen to me. When all else fails, this will never fail you. God's word will never fail you. You've got to get a revelation of that. Don't put your trust in the world. On Thursday night, I spoke online about the, the seven mountains, what they call, and how the, uh, you know, the media, entertainment, sport, government, medical, uh, educational, uh, religious, there's more than seven, actually, all these, all these, uh, the financial world, uh, there's, there's all these big, massive uh, flows on the earth. Don't put your trust in any of them. Put your trust in God. Put your trust in the Creator. Don't, don't do, have an allegiance. Even if you're in one of these departments, don't, don't base your life on that. Don't base, base your life, because you know what? It's run by demons behind the scenes a lot, and it's run by men and women who can fail. Put your wedding garment on. You know, one of the most important things of bride, uh, I think more than anything else, if I have to ask the, the ladies who are married here, I'm sure one of the most important things to you on that day was your wedding dress. More than your cake, more than the food. I don't know, Shelley, you know. I mean, I know what we went through to buy your wedding dress. Hey, come on, you, you tried a whole lot on, and, and we couldn't choose the one for you. We, we just had to, uh, we never even had a budget as far as I know. I hope I'm speaking right now. We just said, Shelly, whatever you want, because we understood that that's a once-of-lifetime thing. I don't know if any of you ladies can remember when you got married. You, you were fussy, man. Ooh, you put the hand that tried to go against your wedding dress, you know, even if it was your husband or your mother or whatever, you know, this is my wedding, you know. <laughs> and you become very possessive. That's how we have to be with, with, with our wedding garments. Don't let the devil steal your garment. Don't let the devil tell you what you must wear or how, what you must say or where you must live. Don't let the outside forces dictate anything against you. That's why you have to have faith. You have to have a believing heart. You have to have trust in God. You have to walk by faith. You have to, you have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Don't just let even, you know, I always talk about three things that, can, that, 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 that we are very close to, whether we like it or not, as family, friends, and foe. <laughs> the three big F's. Don't let any of them stop you from your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Gosh, I was just reading a scripture now. I was studying something, and where Jesus is talking about, he says in the, in the last days, yeah, I was this morning, when I was during my prayer time, I felt to look up the word, he that endures to the end shall be saved. And in that passage of scripture, I think it's, uh, Matthew 10, I think it's in Matthew 10. I was reading some original words and Jesus said there'll come a time when, when brother will betray a brother and a, a brother will hand over their parents to death and it means a literal death. Because of Jesus Christ, there'll be a, a separation in the family. And I'm sure you can see that some of you who are saved and wanting to serve God and some of your unsaved loved ones, are they persecute you? There it is. They're literally handing you over to death in a sense. So we can't, we can't pander to the opinions of man, family, friends, or foe. You've you, you, you got to stay in covenant for your sake. 
Always think about eternity when you make a decision today. How will this affect me for eternity? And I, t- I tell you, it is tough sometimes because we, we, we try and please family. We want to stay on talking terms. But if family, friends, or foe crosses the covenant line, you can't compromise with him. You've you, you got to hear me on that. You cannot compromise with him. You've got to stay in covenant if you want to stay with eternal life. Keep, don't let anyone steal your wedding garment. So here's some of the attributes of a wedding garment. And I'm going to speak as a parallel. This, this is our wedding garment. It's, it's actually the character and behavior in Christ and our works. So in no particular order, love and commitment. When, when, when you walk down the aisle, you're making a promise to that person, I will love and I will be committed to you for the rest of my, my life. So right now, we have to walk in love. We have to walk in a covenant commitment to the Lord. And how do we do it? To the Word, to the written Word. It's very easy. Just, just do what the Bible says. I, I will, I'll even go as far to say this. Even if it kills you to obey God, I'd rather die obeying God than compromise and, and, and miss out on my eternal destiny and take a chance on my eternal destiny and go to hell. It's an it's a eternal commitment that we, we say, I love you, Lord. And then we have to have family and friends there. That's point number two. Who's your real family? This might, this might offend some of you. Your real family is actually the body of Christ. You know that saying, blood is thicker than water, while spirit's thicker than blood. If you really understand covenant and understand the salvation of God, your allegiance will be first to the Lord Jesus Christ and his bride and his body. Hey, listen, I'm talking 50 years of of walking this out. I've been sorely persecuted. I've got seven children in our family. And when I started out with the Lord, I, I, I walked through this, what I'm talking to you about. And I never compromised, and I was accused very vehemently. Even so, one of my family members wanted to take me to court because I was having more allegiance to the church than to, the, to my natural family. For those of you who don't know, this is Michelle, my daughter. I always say she's my favorite daughter because I only have one. <laughs> and people get upset with me, you know. And I say, I got, this is my favorite daughter. No, but, but you, you must also love your other daughter. I don't have any. This is the only one I've got. And uh, say something. Greet us. Oh, yeah. Hello, everybody. Again, I'm back. <laughs> I decided I'm going to stay another week because it was just ridiculous. We got sick and I was like, this is crazy. This is just not of God. And um, me and Devin were so sick. We were stuck at home. We couldn't even visit my, my parents. I don't know what happened. We just got here and got sick. And, um, and so I was like, no, I'm going to just extend my, my flight so I can stay another week to actually spend time with my mom and dad. Because I was like, no. Flats are very expensive, <laughs> so I'm not going to like have to, you know, spend another, who knows, thousands and thousands of pounds just to come and see my mom and dad. Uh-uh. Okay, but um, yeah, anyway, the Lord put something on my heart really quickly. Actually, it's something that he's been um, speaking to me about personally, on a personal basis, Um with the Holy Spirit. And yesterday we actually watched that movie, The Shack. And I was watching it and at the end, I don't know who's ever watched that movie, The Shack. Oh my gosh, you have to watch it. Wow, you have to watch it. Um, It deals with a lot of healing and a lot of things like forgiveness in your heart and just stuff that people hold on to and you just can't let it go. It really, really, really speaks to you personally. But like, I was watching it, and at the end, they show, you know, God, and they show the Father, which is 
God and then they show Jesus and then the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is so special because when Jesus ascended to heaven, he, he gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is meant to be with you wherever you go because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. But the Holy Spirit is special. And when I remember when my dad always used to speak about the Holy Spirit growing up, he would say it's like a dove, you know, like it, you can easily scare the Holy Spirit away. You can easily hurt the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can feel. And you can hurt the Holy Spirit by doing things like how you speak to people, how you treat someone, what you're doing behind closed doors. The Holy Spirit's there and He can see everything. And it's something that is so special to me because I really feel that the Holy Spirit is with me wherever I go and I trust the Holy Spirit. I, I speak to the Holy Spirit. And a lot of us during our Christian walk, we only look to Jesus, but Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And it's all three in one, right? Do you believe that? Do you know that in the Bible? <laughs> he is all three of them. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is with you, you've got to try and remember that He's with you. You've got to try and remember that He can see you and He can hear you. And whatever you ask the Lord for, you've got to believe the Holy Spirit's there. He can hear you. And automatically, Jesus can hear you because the Holy Spirit can hear you. Right? Does that make sense? So wherever you go, wherever you walk, your day-to-day -day things that you do, you've got to trust the Holy Spirit to lead you and to guide you. And that's something that I've been really, really focusing my attention on lately is that there's so much distraction around. This is the biggest distraction of all. The biggest distraction nowadays. Everyone's stuck to their phones. <laughs> We're just so stuck to technology, stuck to our phones, stuck to the TV. But you've got to remember that you have someone there who's ready to speak to. You can speak to the Holy Spirit. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're confused about, you've got to ask the Holy Spirit. And you've got to connect that with your, your Bible and your, the Word of God. You've got to ask the Holy Spirit, okay, where do you want me to read today? What scripture do you want me to open? It's many, many times I've actually, I've actually asked the Holy Spirit to speak to me because we all go through things, right? We all go through trials and we go through really hard things. And I open my Bible and bam, it's right there in front of me what God wants to tell me. And I'm like, what? I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> it really blows my mind that the Holy Spirit can actually hear you. It's like, oh my gosh, you're here. I can't see you, but I know you're here. You're right there next to me and you're helping me. You're helping me. And you know, have you ever, have you ever had a moment where you're, you're literally going about your day and God reminds you of something that you need to forgive someone or something that happened to you, like it comes out of nowhere. That's the Holy Spirit. Sometimes He'll bring things up in your heart, things that you need to deal with. It might be a random time, you know, maybe you're in the taxi or you're somewhere at work and He brings up something to mind. That is the moment you have to start dealing with it straight away. You can't be like, okay, that's weird that I thought about that. That's weird that I remembered that. That's weird that I, I remembered this person that hurt me and I forgot to, I didn't forgive them, but I'm remembering what they did to me. You know, so sometimes God brings those things up for you to remember so that you can, you can deal with them. The Holy Spirit does that. He helps you daily. He helps you throughout the day. He helps you to remember things. He tr he's trying to help you deal with things in your life. And not only just deal with things and how to forgive people and how to let go of things, but also just how to trust Him. You know, we've got to trust Him every day, especially nowadays. Especially the things that are happening today. Um, I was telling my dad... Um, about something that's very scary that's happening <laughs> in Britain at the moment, is that when I go back to Britain, you know, Russia wants to start war with Britain. And it's kind of scary because I'm like, I don't know what that looks like. It could turn into World War Three for the whole world, you know, so not just Britain. But it's something that is real and it's something that's happening. 
in today's time and you think it would never happen, but you just don't know what's going to happen, right? And you don't know what today holds and you don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what next week holds. But that's why you need the Holy Spirit. You need Him to guide you and to speak to you. And you need to be open. And if you can't, if you're battling to hear the Holy Spirit, if you're battling to know that He's there, you've got to pray more. Who here loves to pray? Do you love to pray? Because that's very special to Jesus. It's very special to Him when you want to talk to Him. He loves it. He's like, oh, here's my child. You want to talk to me? I love you so much. And he does. He loves you guys very much. Do you believe that? Sometimes it can be, he'll show you love in different ways. Maybe through discipline. Maybe through a soft answer. Or someone, someone random to help you or to love you, show you love. But yeah, you've got to live every day with the Holy Spirit. And that's just kind of the word that I had for today for everyone is that you've got to trust Him. And don't be fearful of anything. Thanks, my babe. All right, tithes and offering International Christian Centre. And for those of you who are watching online, I want to encourage you that your tithes and offering will, will reward you. God is not mocked. Remember there's a scripture that says uh, in Galatians, God is not mocked. That which a person sows, they'll reap. And see that scripture in a positive way. God is not mocked. The good that I sow, not only financially, but in prayers and in in, 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 in your love, your witnessing, you know, the basics of the faith I always talk about. So I want to encourage you. In Zechariah, I want to just give you three scriptures here. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 17, from the Amplified, it says, Cry yet again, saying, and I want to decree this on every family here in, in our church and people that are connected to our ministry, even online, we have a we have an online flow of people that are connected to this church, believe it or not, to our ministry. Cry yet again, saying, thus is the Lord of hosts. My cities shall yet again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. It's a very interesting scripture, by the way, for me. I'm just thinking of this right now. Because there's so many people against Israel right now, uh, you know. <laughs> and uh, I feel sorry for those that are coming against Israel, to be honest with you. Because in Genesis 12 verse 3, God said, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. So don't go on the side of those that are anti-Israel. Uh, uh, pray for both sides. Pray for Palestine and pray for Israel. Don't, but, but don't go against Israel. That's all I can tell you. They are God's chosen people. And uh, the church hasn't replaced Israel. There, there's people that, and I'm just throwing this in, they call it replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel. No, God still has a covenant with Israel, by the way. If you know end time prophecy, you'll understand that Israel right now is, is under discipline. And God said, if you rebel against me, I'll smite you seven times. They've been smitten six times. There's one more big hiding from God that Israel will go through. And then Jesus will return and they will understand that he is the Savior that they've been rejecting for all this time. I thought I'd just throw that in. Then in Job 36 verse 11, now Job was the wealthiest man in his time. He was the most righteous man. So it's interesting that him being the most wealthiest and the most righteous is that uh, prosperity comes with righteousness. I'll, get, I'll end off with the scripture just now. So Job 36, 11, he says, If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. It's a promise of God. If they obey and serve him. I looked up the word prosperity. Do you know, it's only mentioned about 17 times in Scripture. But let me just quickly get to you the meaning of, of, of prosperity. I did make a note of it here. 
Uh, where's my one Bible? Oh gosh, I did it. Give me a second, and I'll I'll show you what what the word prosperity means. It, it's a word shalom that we know of, but it, it doesn't just mean, you know, a greeting. People say shalom. They, they, they think it's just a greeting, but it means to be safe. It means to be well. It means to have welfare. It means to have health. It means to have favor. It means to prosper. It means to be, uh, I said well, it means completeness. In other words, every area of your life. Nothing missing, nothing broken, everything supplied. Spirit, soul, body, financially, emotionally, intellectually, work, business, ministry, whatever you're involved in. God says he'll never leave you nor forsake you in every area of your life. That is the prosperity of God. It means uh, soundness. It means to be peace and quiet. Uh, it means tranquility and contentment, friendship of human relationships and with God, especially in a covenant relationship. So God wants us to prosper. The other Bible says if we obey and serve him, we'll spend our days, all the days of our life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me how many days? All the days of my life. And the years in pleasures. God's even interested in your, in your luxury in your bonus, in, your, in the extras. He doesn't mind you having a slab of chocolate every now and then, by the way, or having an ice cream or, or going to a fun fair or something like that. He doesn't mind that. That's pleasures. In fact, there's another scripture in Psalms, but it says at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You know that scripture, there, there's something else to that. So God is not against having fun. God's not against bonuses. <laughs> God's not against extra. In fact, when you, when you see how, how wealthy God is, he's a, he's, a, he's a God of opulence. He's not against luxury. Do you know that? He's a God of luxury. I mean, if, if, if the, the, the heaven is paved with streets of gold, hello? And we've just read in our devotions that... Uh, Solomon made gold. There's a scripture that actually says that Solomon made gold and silver as common as the stones in the street. They were playing marbles with gold nuggets. And just left them there and went out. That's how common gold was in Solomon's days. And, and the temple was, was to display the beauty and magnificence of who God is. And then Psalm 35, 27, we know this as well. It says, let them shout for joy and be glad. Have you ever seen someone that's glad? I watched the soccer match with my son last night when Real Madrid won. And I've been to that stadium last year, the new stadium they were building. And I don't know if you saw the TV show, the ecstatic joy on some of these guys. That, that's gladness. I, I wish, you know, I sit there, I, I must be honest, and my heart was like grieving. Because uh, how people worship a sport more than they worship God, how they get so, they, they, almost their whole life depends on it. I mean, those people had to travel and pay mega bucks to get to Wembley Stadium from Germany and, uh, and from uh, Spain. Those were the two major uh, countries that played in London last night. And those supporters had to pay mega bucks to get there. And I mean, the world sacrifices for pleasure, their own pleasure. Anyway, so let them shout for joy and be glad. I, I wish Christians would get that excited about God's victory for what he did for us at Calvary. I always say Jesus scored the biggest goal, eternal goal when he died for our sins at Calvary. Jesus scored the biggest try, that eternal try for humanity when he died for us and became sin for us at Calvary. Uh, Jesus scored the biggest home run <laughs> for eternity when he died on the cross. You can't compare any sport, any achievement to what Jesus did for us at Calvary. And that should make us excited. It should make us very reverent and excited at the same time. But anyway, it says, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor, 
my righteous cause. Yes, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Look at this. We've got to, we've got to say this continually. God be magnified because you have pleasure in the prosperity of your servant. God has pleasure in your prosperity. Now, do you think God is schizophrenic? Watch this. I just had a thought there. Do you think God has pleasure in your poverty? Can't. Because if he has pleasure in our prosperity, it means he cannot have pleasure in our poverty. It's, it's, it's like God has pleasure in our health. God can't have pleasure in your sickness. God can't have pleasure in, in, in suffering and stuff like that. So we, we need to please God. <laughs> you and I need to please God by believing God for prosperity and doing the things in the word that make prosperity come your way. Tithes and offering, obedience to the Lord. Obviously, all those things tied together because God cannot reward a rebel. I always like to say that God cannot bless disobedience. It, it's not covenant. It's not covenant. So God is a God of covenant. He rewards the diligent seeker. He rewards those that call on him. He rewards those that follow him. He rewards those that, 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 that uphold his truth. And he'll never leave nor forsake those. He supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So I want to encourage you guys. Do the, do the word. Be a doer of the word. Let me pray. Father, I pray for every tither, every giver, everyone who attends, Lord, this ministry and attends to it with their hands to the plow, as it were, not only in tithes and offering, but in their prayers, in their support, the physical labors that make this local church run and work. Father, you said you'll not be mocked. That what we sow, Father, we'll reap. And I thank you, Father, that you... Jesus are the possessor of heaven and earth, and the earth is yours and all that is in it, and they who dwell therein. And Lord, I just decree that people will begin to make decisions on our behalf. That is your will for us on earth as it is in heaven, that you have pleasure in our prosperity. And Father, right now we ask you to put pressure on those, even those who are our enemies, because you said when a man's ways please God, he turns even his enemies to be at peace with him. And Father, we ask you, those of us who are, are ways are, are pleasing to you, turn our enemies to be at peace with us, to give us a, a promotion, to give us favor, to give us grace, to give us uh, uh, debt cancellations even. Father, I, I, I decree debt cancellations over some of us who are in dire straits in debt. Father, as long as we look in unto Jesus and, and keeping our hands to the plow and serving you in the in, in the Bible way that we know how, Father, you'll come through for us, Father. Heal every sick body. Father, we rebuke the spirit and there's affliction of sicknesses on our bodies and that, that's come onto the earth now. You said no plague will come near our dwelling. Yeah, it might visit us, but it'll not stay. So right now we evict every spirit of infirmity and we, I speak to every temple of the Holy Spirit and I say now be a healed and, and, and receive your healing and health and uh, decree our bodies function as God created and intended it at creation, Father. You said you wish above all things we prosper and be in health. There we go, Lord, another scripture. So we receive that, Father, in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. Let's go ahead and give. Well, today, most of them are coming around, by the way, taking a long time, decades. I think there's only one more to go. Otherwise, everyone is in. I was shocked. I can't mention names there in case I get a hiding, but I thought my one, my one relative was still very anti-Jesus. But my brother went and visited them, and this relative of mine just said it's only because of Jesus. I was like shocked to hear that. I thought, what? And I've been praying for them for decades. And my brother reported this to me, that this relative just said, it's all about Jesus. It's only Jesus. And I was like shocked. I like thought, what? 
why didn't they tell me? <laughs> they were the ones that persecuted me in the beginning. Why didn't they come and tell me? Hey, Rich, I'm serving Jesus now. Anyway, I had to get over that one. <laughs> you know? But I'm rejoicing like, yes, they in, Lord. What? I didn't know that. And then number three, personalized ceremony. A personalized, it's a meaningful and personalized ceremony that reflects the couple's values, beliefs, and love story. Are we preparing for that wedding day? Are we, are we doing what the covenant says? Are we dressing according to, to the, the ornaments and the, 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 the necessities and the extras? Are you watching your heart that you, you don't have unforgiveness in your heart because that spoils the wedding garment? It might disqualify you. Unforgiveness. Pastor Fred, I heard him preach it from the pulpit. If any of you know who Pastor Fred Roberts is, my pastor, he said, if you die as a Christian with unforgiveness in your heart, you'll go to hell. And on his deathbed, because he was bedridden for a, for a while before he went to be the Lord, my wife and I visited him the one time, and he said, there's one more thing I've got to do. And I plucked up the courage to ask him. I said, Pastor Fred, what is that? He said, I've got to forgive my son-in-law for what he did to my daughter. He said, I've been trying to phone him, but he doesn't want to answer the phone. So son-in-law, you know who you are. If you happen to be watching this, Pastor Fred tried to get hold of you. He told me this personally, that he had to forgive you for what you did to his daughter. It's not Pastor John. Don't worry, it's not Pastor Neville. It was the other, other one, because Pastor F Fred's got three daughters. Has he? Yeah, he's got three. So it wasn't Pastor John. Clarify it. It wasn't Pastor Neville. It was the other dude. And I, Pastor David and I looked at each other. We were shocked by that. We thought, but Pastor Fred, you've got it made. Surely you, you don't have any thing in your heart against this man. He said, I, I'm dealing with my heart. I'm making sure. Richard said, when I, when I die, I've, I've forgiven him. Ooh, that was sobering. Almost every time I was with Pastor Fred, he would look at me now and say, Richard, you're going to stand before Jesus one day. Because you see, he was closer to the end than what, what we were. I'm getting close now. Do you know, in, listen to me, in, in 11 years' time, if, if I'm still alive, I'll be 80. Ah! You know, shocking that is. I've, I've run this church with my wife for half of my life. Half of my life I've been serving you guys. Half of my life. I'm 68 now. For 34 years I've been running this church. Wow. And it's 34 years has come. And 34 years has gone. What I've done, I've done. What I haven't done, I haven't done. Yo. And I think the closer you get to the end, the more you're realizing any day I could go now. Do you know that I could go any day? I don't even know if I'm going to live to 80. I don't know. I don't want to be a big deal and say, oh, faith, long life. I'm not, I'd rather say, Lord, give me each day to help me. Let each day count. Let me serve you with all my heart, my might, my strength, my resources, everything. I want to be someone who gets into heaven. The Lord says, stop, Richard. You can stop now. You, you're dead, Richard. Your, your body's there. You can stop now. No more work. Come rest. Get into heaven and still like wanting to do stuff. The Lord says, it's fine. It's resting time now. Sure. A personalized ceremony. Are you, are you making your values the same as Christ's values. You see, we have to weigh up what, what is valuable. That's why, the, that's why we have scriptures like this. Jesus is your first love. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Seek first the king and his kingdom and his righteousness. We've got all those scriptures. 
What, what does Jesus value? Well, the, the number one thing he values is people. That's why you don't criticize. Don't criticize each other yet. Someone talks against someone in the church, you, you should be the first one to stand up and say, hey, shut your mouth. That's someone Jesus died for. That, that's my covenant f- family you're talking about. Because criticism is betrayal, by the way. You've heard me say this so many times. The Father doesn't criticize the Holy Spirit to Jesus. Jesus doesn't criticize the Father to the Holy Spirit and whatever. They, they are, the Godhead is in covenant. They love each other equally. And Jesus prayed for us. He said, Father, show them you love them as much as you love me. And we ought to love the brethren as Christ loved the church and give ourselves up for them. Greater love is no man than this, than a man or a woman obviously laid down their life for their friends. And Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I tell you to do. If you keep my commandments. That's the personal ceremony. That's what the scripture says, that when we see him, we will be like him. For those of us who are, who are getting our dress ready, <laughs> our garments ready, when you get to Jesus, you say, hey, I'm just like you. I behave like you. And we can on this side of eternity. That's why don't let any lie come to you. Wherever this lie comes from, demons or whatever, that you can't live a righteous life in a wicked world. Of course you can. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Who said you can't love? Who said you can't forgive? What voice is that that's telling you you can't serve God the way he commands us to? Because he says, I'll help you. Just like my daughter spoke about the Holy Spirit. He's in you. He's within you. He's there to empower you to live a godly life. The Holy Spirit's not a weakling. Yeah, he's sensitive like a dove, but he is, he's, 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 the, he's a strong spirit. He's the agent of creation. He's powerful, the Holy Spirit. But we grieve him and we quench him by, by siding with the flesh. That's why we have to, we have to strip ourselves. We gotta, the Bible says, by the Holy Spirit, by the way, put to death the deeds of the flesh. Crucify the flesh. I am desperately trying to finish a book that I have to edit. It's quite a, no one else can do it, only me. So I'm, I'm plowing my way through a book that I'm trying to get out, how to crucify the flesh. There's a, it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff that I have to go through before it can be properly edited, but I have to take out a whole lot of stuff and uh, that I'm, I'm battling with the time. I've got like about four books in the queue to come out. <laughs> oh, Lord, you pray for me for my books. I, I'm, I'm wanting to ha- set a goal is to have that book printed, the significance of your birth, and handed out free. But I've got a certain mindset that I, I want to, uh, by the time... I die, I want to have handed out a million of those books in this country, free. And I, and I, I can see a way possible. I want to set up a special website for that book, The Significance of Your Birth. I want to start giving that book away for free. I know it's for sale, but I want to have it printed in a cheaper way and, and structured in a way that people get saved through that book, The Significance of Your Birth. And I know I've got to put my hand to the plow and start the ball rolling. But I'm wanting to get a whole lot printed and I'll probably be asking for donations and, and offering them free already. You can actually download it free. I didn't know that. But if you go to Amazon, uh, I think the e-copy is free. I've made it zero money. It's this one here, The Significance of Your Birth. It's a brilliant book. It's, I, I'll show you in this booklet the, how important our birth is to Jesus' birth. Equal. Equal importance. So I'll give you a scripture for it. 
Then I give you seven reasons why you were born. And then I have a, a sinner's prayer at the back. It's a little booklet. You can download this for free on Amazon. If it doesn't work for you, come back, tell Tefa. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> but uh, it, it, uh, um, that's what I want to do. I, I want to be as evangelistic as I can. So I thought uh, the Bible says that pastor must do the work of an evangelist. And I thought about this for quite a while. And I, but I need to get the ball rolling. So maybe you can join me in this project where we can uh, eventually have handed out a million of these. It's possible, you know that. All I need is about, I don't know how much it will cost to print one, but the more you print, the less the cost is. But I believe that we can do this. I don't know how we're going to do it. Maybe we, we'll, we'll print thousands and thousands and then we'll send you guys Bloemfontein, Joburg, Pretoria, Cape Town with a couple of thousand and you just stand and you hand them out. Spend a weekend. Who would like to do that? You go to the beach. But you've got to pay your own way. You go with a couple of thousand. Go, uh, uh, you know, Cape Town, what's it, that point there? With that fancy mall, he's always gonna, no one's going to stop you giving out books for free. Who's going to stop you? I'm not trying to sell anything I'm giving away. Imagine doing that, guys. Imagine if we each took about, uh, about 10,000 books each. Each. Hamish take 10, Eleanor take 10, Karen take 10, hit Cape Town for a weekend. Spread out, you drop... Uh, Car off at one place, Illinois in another place, and you got your haversack with your books, and you just free book, free book. Someone's gonna get saved, you know that. Someone will get saved because who's who's gonna not want to know about has, the significance of my birth? There's gonna be some curiosity there. Anyway, I thought I'd just you see I gotta speak it out. Otherwise, if I don't speak it out, then I'll then I won't commit myself. Okay, let me do one more, and then we'll call it a day. And number five is, uh, no, number four, sorry, number four. Exchanging vows and rings as a symbol of eternal love and commitment. Do you know how you exchange vows with God? See, God, let me show you this. I've said it before. Imagine this is God up here. And this is, this is the earth here, down here. God has given us his Bible, the word. So God cannot reach you un, unless he goes through his word. He, he has to also keep his word. He's a God of covenant. He's written this out that even he has to keep it. That's why money doesn't grow on trees. If <laughs> you notice that? Because God could. God could give you a money tree. But he's, he's not a counterfeit. See, we have to work and believe for our money. Okay. Now, for us to get to God, we also have to go through his word. Because God's a God of covenant. He made it that way that even he has to keep to his word. That's why he said stuff like, as my covenant will I not break, nor alter that which has gone out of my mouth. I think that's Psalm 89, 34. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall prosper where I've sent it, accomplish what I please. It will not return to me unfurnished. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Has he not said, will he not do it? There's so many scriptures like that where God has put himself on the spot that he can't even violate his word. In fact, Hebrews, it says there's two things that is impossible for God to do. It's to lie and break his covenant. Wow. You've got to always remember that. That is the covenant vows and the rings. We, we, we don't have a physical ring. But you know what I believe the ring is? The crown of righteousness. It's a ring. They're, they're, in fact, there are five crowns. Maybe I must deal with that next week. Show you that there's five crowns for the believer to achieve. And that's like a form of a ring, a, 
A, a ring is, when you, when you take a ring, it's got no beginning and it's got no end. It's, it's, a, it's a circle. It means it's a symbol of eternity, by the way. A ring is a symbolic of eternity. In fact, that song that Michelle sang, the songwriter should have just add, should have said this. Maybe you can change the words later, Mish. Uh, and a thousand generations. No, the Bible says righteousness endures to a thousand generations. A thousand is symbolic of eternity. Because a generation is 40 years. So a thousand times 40, how long is that? 40,000 years. We, we only have come 6,000 years from Adam. So that, when the, when the Bible says righteousness endures to a thousand generations, it's speaking of eternity. Going from life into eternity. <laughs> so that, that is the ring. We, what is the ring? The, the ring, I, I believe, is, 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 is the works because this doesn't really make a marriage because you watch some men, they'll take their ring off and they'll go and they'll commit adultery. You even see it in movies. A guy goes into a place and he slips his ring off. So this, this doesn't make you married. It's a, it's a symbol I'm married, but, but my, the ring, the actual vows is here in my heart. What I do in private when I'm not with my wife physically, we're not physically with Jesus now. What makes us think he can't see us? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever thought of that. Yeah, and just when you're about to do something wrong, let that scripture come to your mind, abstain from all appearance of evil. Because no one can see, but God's with you. Like my daughter said, Holy Spirit's in you. We should be so sensitive to him that we should hear him say, uh-uh, what are you doing now? Sorry, Lord. In fact, the Bible does say that, by the way. In, in, in Corinthians chapter 6, it says, whatever you attach yourself to, you're attaching God to. When you sin, you make God sin. It says that in the scripture. That's why the scripture says, don't be unequally yoked. A light cannot mix with darkness. Satan cannot mix with Christ. And uh, there's five things that it talks about or not agreeable with each other. And it's covenant terminology. You've got to understand the whole of Scripture is covenant terminology. Covenant, keep the vows for your sake. And God, God reminds us of that. Uh, uh, I think it's Deuteronomy. I, I don't know if it's 31, somewhere around there where God says, I set heaven and earth against you this day uh, that you, you choose life for death, blessing, or curse. And then God still carries on. He says, but choose life that you may live, you and your household. And then Deuteronomy 6, 24. His commandments, uh, keep his commandments because they're for our good and our family's good. And then in the epistle of uh, uh, John, it says, his commandments are not burdensome or grievous. They, they are doable for our sake. That's why Jesus said, my my service is easy. My burden is actually light for your sakes. He, he, God's made all things possible, guys. That's why I don't, don't believe. Watch out for anything that, that comes against trying to convince you against that you can't be a good Christian. Well, you're not supposed to be a good Christian. You're supposed to be a God Christian. <laughs> Don't, don't watch out for lies and anything negative against any of these promises. Don't believe those lies. And I tell you, the voices out there are screaming blue murder. There's so many voices out there that are against this book. In every area of life, they 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 got megaphones, man. They come through the media, through the movies conversations with the unbelievers. Whew, man. And, it, and you know what? The Bible says in the last days, Revelations 22 verse 11, the wicked will be more wicked, the unrighteous will become more unrighteous, but the righteous are becoming more righteous. Which means, if, if that's what the scripture says, that means it doesn't matter how bad it gets, I can still keep my purity 
I can still keep my righteousness. I can still keep my holiness. Anyone agree with me on that? It's very silent in this Baptist church this morning. <laughs> so I want to encourage you. You can do all things. Make sure you got the wedding garments being prepared. Make sure you're working on your own wedding garment. That's why four times in the scripture, you've heard me say it before, four times the Bible repeats the same verse, the just shall live by his own faith. I can't expect my wife to live my righteousness for me or my children or, or the church. I've got to live my own righteousness. I've got to make my own decisions of godliness before God and before you. Nobody can force you otherwise. Even if, well, the, you know there, there, there are levels of martyrdom. I don't know if you know that the, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where Jesus said, you'll, you'll receive power after the, the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto me. That word witness in the Greek is the word martyr. So none, none of us, there's only a few that die physically for the faith. But a lot of us die, you've got to die to pride, you've got to die to fear, you've got to die to embarrassment, you understand? That's being a martyr, you've got to die to self. You've got to die, die to your personal feelings. Oh, they hurt me, they don't like me, they, they're mocking me about my Jesus. Yeah, Jesus said they do it. In fact, Jesus said when, when they begin to do that, get excited. The word glad, as I said, rejoice for great is your reward in heaven. Great. Not going to get a little incy meansy reward. The rewards in heaven going to make, going to make anything you'd want to have on earth look tame. A Royals Royce, a mansion, uh, whatever, whatever you can think to dream to to experience on this earth, the rewards in heaven are going to make this look tame. Tame, tame, tame. In my Father's house, Jesus has said, are many mansions. I go there and I'm preparing it for you so that where I am, you will be there too. My goodness. I think we're going to be shocked to see what homes God's got for us. Let me just say this also. In closing, I read it this morning, and at first time it stood out to me. Jesus was talking about the end times in, in Matthew 10. And he ended up saying that the people that reject him on this earth, listen to this. He says it's going to be, he said when you go into one city, that's what he was, he was giving the disciples that's what it is, Matthew 10. He was giving them power over devils and demons and to go from city to city. And he said, if a city receives you or a home receives you, let your peace be upon it. But if they reject you, wipe the dust off your very feet, for it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than those cities or those homes that reject you. It will be more tolerable. Sodom and Gomorrah had no mercy they were consumed. Every person died with volcanic eruption of some kind. And Jesus said it's going to be more tolerable on the day of judgment than for Sodom and Gomorrah because they didn't have what, uh, what you, you're having today. They didn't have Jesus. So Jesus is saying, when people reject me, the judgment's greater. So we must always be accepting Jesus. Do you know you have to choose Jesus every day? I don't know if you realize that. I have to choose being with my wife every day. No matter how, what other beautiful floozy comes and flashes herself at me. I've got to choose Pastor Debbie every day. I've got to choose my children every day. I can't say, oh, Michelle, because you, you know, this, that, and there's some other person that's better. Let me, let me. Let me denounce you and, and let this be my child. Mm -mm, it doesn't work like that. Covenant. Say covenant. Hey, I tell you, it's a word that's got to be in, your, in our, our being. In him we live and move and have our being. Covenant. 
Don't break covenant for your sake. Let's stand and let's pray. Did you get something today? I know it's a hard word, but I, I believe it's very prophetic. I believe God is, is, is preparing us. Who knows? Who knows if this message is... So, you know, there's one thing that I thought of. I'll be honest with you. I actually thought about this. I thought, Lord, why are you giving me a message like this? And uh, uh, let me say this. Uh, no one can put a time or a date on Jesus' second return. But uh, in, in the early 80s, I wrote and I've compiled a manual on the book of Revelation called The Revelation of Jesus Christ, I taught it a verse-by-verse verse interpretation of the book of Revelation. and Because I studied it for many, many months and, and I compiled a manual that I taught. And I did a lot of, with that, I did a lot of end-time prophecies that have come to pass and are coming to pass. And I kind of worked out that when I'm round about 70, Jesus should come. <laughs> but like next year, I'll be 70, by the way. But round about that time. Then the Lord gives me this message, and I'm thinking to myself, Father, are you trying to tell us something? Because I, I've noticed with me, and, and some of you might not be aware of this, but over the decades, many, many times, God has given me a message two years in advance of someone like Joyce Meyer, T.D. Jakes, or these big preachers will come out with. I actually hear it, and I preach the message, and two years later, it comes out with some of these big preachers. But I've already preached it in the church. I've actually noticed that, that, that prophetic gift in me. So I want to put this to you today. Could be, either way, God's preparing for each of us to meet with Jesus. Either in the rapture, because I believe in it. I've told you there's seven raptures. We're the fourth one. Let me repeat it again in case anyone doesn't believe in raptures. Enoch was raptured. Elijah was raptured. Jesus was raptured. The church will be the fourth rapture. The 144,000 in the book of Revelation will be the fifth rapture. The converts of the 144,000 will be the sixth rapture. And the seventh rapture, God's number, will be the two witnesses that get killed in Jerusalem. They're there for three and a half days dead, and then the Spirit of God raises them up, and they get caught up to heaven. So whenever you see the word caught up, it's a rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible. God, there's the seven perfect raptures. So it could be that God's giving me a prophetic message to warn. Maybe just you guys, because I don't have a voice to the nations. But I believe when I, uh, uh, that I say something, maybe it spreads. I don't know. It's, it's happened. Uh, did I, I remember the, the Sunday morning, give, just to give an example. And I'll say it because it happened. Was it last Sunday or the Sunday before I spoke about Russia, China, and Islam? Was it last Sunday or the Sunday before? Sunday before. Now, you've got to go on uh, my YouTube channel and listen to that prophecy. And remember, I prayed against the agents of Satan in those areas against South Africa. That afternoon... I don't think it's coincidental. That afternoon, the prime minister of Iran, the butcher of Iran, dies in a helicopter crash. That afternoon. Maybe God took, just like we've just read about that one king, I think it was Ahab. Remember the guy shoots an arrow and it just, he thinks he's just shooting an arrow meantime, but God directed it into Ahab. I think it was Abe. Remember, he sat and he died in his chariot. Maybe the Lord took this arrow. Chief demon of Islam taken out. 
I don't believe it's coincidental to what I, I shared there. And it seems that, that I have a track record of that happening in my life. I don't look for it, it just happens. And I, I want to put to you that this message could be very prophetic. And it will happen one of two ways. Either we'll die before the rapture. We've got to be ready when we enter into eternity. You've got to have your garments on. You don't want Jesus to call your friend and say, what are you doing here? You don't have your garments. Gabriel, out of darkness. Find him hand and foot. So I believe this is a prophetic message as well to prepare us to just realign our, our goals of life. Priority number one, Jesus. Not my work, not my business, not my family, not this Jesus, my relationship with Jesus. It's number one, my highest calling to be conformed to the image of God's Son. Father, I pray for us. I submit this word, Lord. To our hearts, those of us that are here and those that will be watching online, I pray for conviction, for adventure, Lord, you lead someone who's unsaved to watch this message that the conviction of the Holy Spirit for sin that's present, possibly, righteousness to do and judgment that is coming, that you convict even us of that, Father, that we could get our lives in order. Just like you said to Hezekiah, your days are numbered, put your house in order. Just like your, the parable to the, the man who said, oh, I've done well, I'm going to lodge bonds, I'm going to make bigger, I've done well, I'm going to eat, drink and be merry. But Lord, you, you said you're full, this soul, your, this night your soul will be required of you. Father, we've got no guarantee when our day is up when our days are numbered. According to Psalm 139, every day that is mentioned for us is there already in heaven. And only you know the day of our death, the day of our departure. But we have a responsibility to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called, Lord. We are responsible for our own salvation. We have to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, God. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to remind us of this message and these words that we don't take a chance on our eternal destiny. I pray for anyone, Lord, that it's not right with you, Lord, that today is the day of salvation. Today they will repent. Today they will make right with you, Father. We don't have to have an altar call for that. Lord, you're right there with them. They just have to surrender and say, okay, Jesus, I'm getting back on track. I'm giving my life over to you. I'll serve you. I'm your servant. I'm your child. What do you want from me? That's the, that's the decision they have to make today, to walk with you or to walk away from you, Lord. You cannot do two at the same time. You cannot be lukewarm. You'll spew us out of the body of Christ. Out of your mouth means out of the body. We'll be rejected if we, if we compromise. We cannot compromise, Father, and I pray against any spirit of compromise, Lord, that we will not compromise till the day of our death, God. We will uphold you. We will uphold your word, your covenant, your people, your church, and you as the head of the church, Lord. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. We all said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching. We know you received something encouraging to empower your relationship with Christ. Please take advantage of our other materials by Richard and Deborah. Should you desire to bless and support this ministry, please use the following details to impart your blessing. May the Lord return the favor to you a thousandfold according to Deuteronomy 1 verse 11. Should you be in the vicinity of Peter Marisburg in KZN, 
You are welcome to attend our church service at International Christian Center, Peter Maritzburg, located at 28 Pilot Road, Epworth. Our times are as follows, at 9 a.m. in the morning. If you have never surrendered your life to Christ or need to recommit to the Lord Jesus, please pray this prayer to God now. Dear God, our Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. As I ask you to forgive and cleanse me of all of my sins by the power of your shed blood, I receive you as my Savior, Lord and friend. As you make me your child today, Thank you again, Father, for the indescribable gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the Lord lead you to a Bible-based church. Alternatively, contact us to be of assistance in this important next step of your relationship with Christ. God bless Richard and Deborah Gray.